morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on which part of the world you're watching me from. I'm Black Bright, broadcasting from the UK. Welcome to my channel. If it's the first time you're passing through, you're welcome to subscribe. You're welcome to share the video if you think it's of use to someone else. And you're welcome to like, put the thumbs up, and you also have the privilege of putting the hands down if you don't agree with what I say. Um, most of the information I share or provide is based from sources I receive, from the media, media and stuff like that and I just tend to give my opinion on it. Today I'm not so much going to give my opinion but to share with you information I have received which is very relevant to the deportation of the 17 um, Jamaicans um, on Tuesday. So I'm going to start off with um, David Lammy's talk or speech in the Houses of Parliament. You will see the Houses of Parliament is very sparse. There's hardly anybody there that tells you something about how interested they are in getting to know, the, get into the crux of the matter and sorting things out. And then I'm going to give you the breakdown as it has been given to me of the 17 people who were deported. And you will see from that breakdown that deportation <clears throat> in large part was unjustified. <clears throat> Sorry about that. James Blair, a Scottish Irish MP, owned 1,598 slaves in British Guyana. When slavery was abolished in 1833, he was awarded £83,350 in compensation a sum worth £665 million today. In total, the British government paid out today's equivalent of £16.5 billion to compensate some 3,000 families that own slaves for the loss of their so-called property and investment. It represented at the time 40% of the Treasury's annual spending budget. The sum was so large that it took British taxpayers 182 years to pay off. Taxpayers, like the children of Windrush, who were invited to Britain from Commonwealth countries in 1948. The children of the very slaves that James Blair owned. The children of people who had their British identity thrust upon them centuries ago, when they were stolen from their homes and sold as property. When it was revealed that hundreds of the Windrush generation had been wrongly detained, deported, left destitute and made homeless by the government. Originally the expectation was that the Home Office would distribute somewhere between 200 million and 570 million to victims of the Windrush scandal. But just £62,000, 198, has been paid out to 36 people from the Home Office compensation pot. These are people who've been denied a lifetime of employment, housing, citizenship, wealth and opportunity. Many of the victims are still heavily in debt. Take Glenda Césaire, who came to Britain legally as a three-month-old child in 1961 from Dominica. She was sacked from her job in a GP practice and then denied welfare while she remained unemployed. How did the Home Office arrive at a compensation fee of only £22,664? Was this meant to cover the loss of earnings over 10 years, the impact on family life and the distress caused by being wrongfully detained? For so many people, these petty payouts have been nothing short of insulting, degrading and shameful. What does this tell Windrush citizens? It tells them that the British state is more likely to compensate the descendants of slave owners than the descendants of slaves. That the British state is more likely to reimburse those who made a living displacing human beings in the 19th and 20th century than those they continue to displace in the 21st. That they live in a country that thinks the loss of profit from colonialism is more regrettable than the continu continuation of colonialism itself. We still don't know how many people were wrongly detained and deported. What we do know is that only 3% of 
of Windrush claimants have so far received compensation. This is a national disgrace. Every day an injustice is not rectified constitutes a new injustice in itself that is committed. At least 11 people have died before they received any compensation. How many more will the government let die in the hope that the outrage dies with them? The Windrush citizens can never be repaid. There is no financial settlement that will restore the dignity that was stolen from them. There is no amount of money that will reverse years of pain from family separation. And there is no reimbursement that will rectify state-sanctioned brutality. But the government seems to think that the appropriate response to this is to absolve themselves of any responsibility to compensate altogether. The Windrush victims deserve much more than the mere crumbs from one of the most grievous scandals in this country's modern history. At the very least, the government should show black British citizens as much remorse as was given to those that enslaved their ancestors. That will be the beginning of a long process of national self-reflection, repentance and justice. Yeah, that's very, very sad. But the problem is I don't think people like David Lammy and people who have faith in the system realize how racist the institution is. I don't think they realize that they do not have any remorse. I don't think he realizes that the, it, the, the uh, illegal deportations was quite deliberate. These people know what they're doing and what they're saying to you is what are you going to do about it? What can you do about it? When they um, blatantly um, defy the law, that is a deliberate act of rebellion. And what they're saying by paying out petty compensations is that's all you're worth. You're lucky to get 22000 You're bloody lucky to get 22000 You shouldn't even be here because that is how they think. They don't have remorse. So, to, I mean, David Lammy is speaking to people as though they're rational human beings. He's not talking to them for who they are, which, are, which is people who don't give a toss about black people and what they've been through. They've done their job. Now get out of our country. We don't want you here. And we're going to make it as difficult as possible for you to live here. And we're going to make examples of people who live here. And so those people who have committed a crime, regardless of how small, they are the examples to show you do not belong here. Even though one of them was actually born in the UK. One had a British passport. But it doesn't matter because he's missing the point. The point is... They don't want black Jamaicans in the country. They don't want black Nigerians. They don't want black Ghanaians. They don't want black French. But the Jamaicans are seen as the most troublesome. So they want to make spectacles out of them. And this is the way they do it. They can't, they can't do it any other way. They can't do it anyway. Basically, they're quite afraid of Jamaicans. So Jamaicans fall right in their hands when they get aggressive, when they um, break the law. They're playing right into their hands. When, when Jamaicans get rebellious and think they can fight the system, they're playing into their hands. And they've got every excuse to deport them. But Jamaicans don't think like that. They think, you think you have liberty with me. And they have so much pride and indignation that they play into the hands of people who are setting them up. You don't get anywhere with that attitude. You think you can tell me what I've You better speak to me with respect. That's what some of them say to the police officers, you know. Speak to me with respect. The police don't care. Do you think they want to respect you? Who are you? And, and 
until we get it in our heads that the, that the people like the police and those who are racist in British society, I'm not saying British society is racist, those who are racist in British society, until they get it in their heads that they want a rebellion, they want all the Jamaicans to come out and protest so they can do away with them all and have a le legitimate reason for doing so. So why do you think they're making a spectacle? Why do you think they're letting Jamaicans know what they're doing to them, how they're humiliating them? Because they want you all to rise up and make a, make a noise and protest so they can bust your ass, deport you or put you in jail. Anyway, this is the breakdown of the deportees. Received it last night. Um, the source is unknown, um, but it was on a type document. And I've got every reason to believe that the, these are fact is factual information. I've got no reason to deny it, but um, I put the disclaimer that because I don't know the source, and so, therefore I cannot guarantee its accuracy. But I'm going to share the information because only because it makes sense. So 13 of the deportees came to the UK as children. Nine of the deportees came to the UK under the age of 10. They went through British education system, primary, secondary education and college. 12 of them have been in the UK for 19 years. The shortest time that any of the deportees spent in the UK was eight years for someone who came as a child. The longest time that one of the deportees came into the UK was 41 years. He came as a four-year-old child in 1977. Four years old, you know. If you looked at a four-year-old child. And the thing is, the formative years of a child is between four and eight. That is what, um, that is what their, um, what you call it, their foundation is made on. Those formative years between the age, I think it's three and eight. So he came when he was four. So he, for all intents and purposes, is British. One person was born in the UK and taken back to Jamaica at four months old by his Windrush generation mother. And the thing is, is that you can't, you're not supposed to be able to deport somebody who was born on the soil unless they're a terrorist or they, you know, national security. So how does he fit into their um, agenda? I mean, he shouldn't be on that plane if he was born in the UK. He's not a threat to society. Eighteen have connections to the Windrush generation through relatives. Nine through their grandmother. One through his mother. Two through great-grandparents and the rest through aunties and uncles. One has a Windrush grandfather who served in the army. Um, one um, has her Windrush generation grandparent who died serving as a British soldier. And you might say, oh, look at why they, um, what have their grandparents got to do with it? Or their great grandparents, how do they expect to be accepted based on them? But in America, they, you know, to prove that you're American citizen, the, for the people that they want to claim who are American citizens, they have to be three generations removed. So the, um, they have to have the, the mother, the grandparent and the great parent. And in some cases, the great grandparent. And that is what the, how they determine who is an American citizen. So likewise, with the Windrush generation, the same applies. The mother the grandmother and the great-grandparents. That is what qualifies them to be Windrush generation. Great-great, maybe not,
from the great grandparents, the same as it applies to citizenship, should apply to the Windrush Generation children. Or Windrush Generation, period. Okay, one was brought to the UK by his Windrush Generation grandmother. Eleven had indefinite leave to remain. So those people thought they were set. Those people thought, those Jamaicans thought, yes, me, I'm indefinite leave to remain. And them can't kick me off. Me daddy! Hmm. See what happened? Definite leave to remain. Still get kicked out. Definite leave to remain means you can stay here indefinitely, but there is always a proviso that people do not realise the same way in your passport. They can take away your passport at any time. Even people born on the soil, if they choose, the same like with Shemaima Begum, if they choose to take away or confiscate or deny your passport, they can do that. So just because you have indefinite leave to remain doesn't mean you can stay here indefinitely and do whatever you want. It doesn't mean that. So these people have made silly mistakes regardless of what they are and this is the penalty that they pay. One was born in Britain, had a British passport. See? Deported. I don't understand that one. I don't understand that one at all. I didn't hear on the news that they said they had any terrorists in Jamaica. Or they were sending a terrorist on the plane. I didn't hear that. How can you be born in Britain, have a British passport and be deported? To me, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense at all. That has to be investigated. That's the only one that I'm thinking, I wonder how valid this information is because I don't understand how that works. So if anybody knows who's watching this video, please tell me how they can deport someone, someone born in Britain who had a British passport Unless they are doing what I said they might do with the children. They can send them to Jamaica because as far as they're concerned, if you have, if your parents are Jamaican and you can prove your parents are Jamaican, Jamaica will accept you as a Jamaican citizen. That's the only thing I can think of. And you watch this space. They'll be doing that with the children, the Jamaican children who are in this country and who have been undocumented. They'll be doing that. You haven't paid your 1,000, whatever it is, to document your British child and you are of Jamaican parentage. They'll be shipping them off sooner or later. You watch this space. They'll be chained, doing some kind of amendment to the law. I don't even think they have need to do an amendment to the law. To be honest, I don't think they need to. Because from their, um, well, they would have to do an amendment to the law because basically they're born in the country and they're not allowed to make them stateless at the moment. But they wouldn't be stateless because Jamaica's constitution doesn't change. So they wouldn't be stateless because if Jamaica accepts people who are born in England as Jamaican because their parents are Jamaican, they wouldn't be stateless. So my new people over here with, you, with your children, you know, mine. You see what's happening? You think you're here, you think you have your, your, your children born in the country, you have your indefinite leave to remain, and you think you're safe. Hmm. People are dread, I'm telling you. There's 36 British children have been adversely affected by the deportation. Two babies are on the way, so there'll be two mothers who have fatherless children, single parents. Um, ten have never been back to Jamaica, not even for a holiday. One went back to bury his grandmother. 
One was deported without medication. BBC was interviewing him. They said, if you don't have your medication on you, we're not allowed to give it to you. Can you imagine? That was a life-threatening disease he had. That would be premeditated murder. Why wouldn't you allow somebody their medication? You see the minds, you see the minds of the people you're dealing with. That should tell you something. They don't have a heart, they don't have a soul. No compassion, no empathy. You're dealing with a bunch of narcissists who don't give a toss. And you know what's hard for black people? Because they have, they have this innate spirituality, they can't believe that people can operate in that way. But they need to understand that they can and they do and they will. One was a non-violent offender. Versus a violent criminal offender. One was in um, an accommodation provided by charity. Would you believe that he left with the clothes on his back? Can you imagine the wickedness to let somebody... Oh. I have to breathe. Let somebody leave the country with just the clothes on their backs. Can you imagine? Oh, I tell you something, this is sinful. Even my mother, my mother doesn't call me enough. I go to see my mother every two weeks. My mother called me last night about this. That is how it moved her. I'm the one that normally calls my mum. My mum hardly ever calls me. And I'm telling you, for her to call me about this, it tells you something. So when you're thinking about those who are undocumented, when we're thinking about the children that are in this country, um, those, bo those born to parents who are not British nationals or those who born to parents who are undocumented, um, there are, I think there are over 107,000 of them, 107,000 of them, and four unaccompanied minors granted temporary leave to remain until the age of 17, and then 17 and a half, and then when they reach 18, they refuse their application to become lawful residents. So they've been in the country all the time, you know. So these people who you haven't documented, these children who you haven't documented, after they, when they reach 18, they then become adults and they have to um, apply on their own cognizance, on their own merit. They're no longer children. And some of them, some of these government officials waited out, you know, until they reach 18. And then they have the privilege of rejecting their application and deporting them. I can't tell, I can't stress how important it is to legitimise your children. Even if you can't, well, I don't know if you can, if you're not, well, I don't even know, you must be able to legitimise your children if they're born in the country, even if you're not legitimate, because they have a right, they have a right to be here, and you're putting their lives in jeopardy. Do you want the same thing that could happen to you if it hasn't happened to happen to your children? I'm sure you don't. There's a little bit more here. Um, a number of barriers to prevent undocumented individuals from assessing settlement, such as lack of knowledge, prohibitive costs of application and lack of access to immigration advice. So a lot of people, they can't get the immigration advice. You know, you know, every every night I think to myself, should I study immigration? And, you know, my heart tells me I should and I may well, but it's still 
going to take me, goodness knows, about two or three years. By then, the damage is done. So all I can do is feed you the information. But at the moment, you know, it's costing, look, £1,012 to register your child, to get citizenship. And then these people, they don't have immigration advice. Some of them, they pay money. Then they find out they're not entitled. Then they lose the money. You know how much money is lost because they haven't been advised properly. And I get people, because I do these videos, writing me saying, I'm in this position. What can I do? I can't advise. All I know is that if you're illegal in the country, you know, you better be careful. That's all I know. I don't know about loopholes. Immigration advisors will know about loopholes. I don't know about loopholes. And loopholes are a way around the system where you might have a right, whether it's um, right of life in the UK, whatever it is. There are certain circumstances. But, you know, it's guaranteed that probably 90% do not qualify for that. Okay, of the 674,000 undocumented individuals estimated to be living in the UK, 2015, two, no, 215,000 are estimated to be children. So out of 674,000 undocumented individuals estimated to be living in the UK, 215,000 are estimated to be children. Of these children, 107,000 live in London. According to the report estimates, around half of children with insecure immigration status were born in the UK. These are children who have known no other country, but their future prospects in this country or in the country of their birth remain uncertain. Despite a number of existing routes to individuals to secure their status, various barriers have led to low numbers of individuals accessing these routes over time. These include the rising cost of home office fees, increasingly complex immigration systems, reduced availability of high quality and free legal advice, as well as government cuts to legal aid for most immigration cases. So, what can I say, peeps? All I can do is keep you updated, keep you informed, and hope that somewhere within what I say, you'll find some, well, it's of some help. That's all I can say. And that's all for now. Bye-bye.